Hey, hello, everybody, and welcome to a very special broadcast from Creative One. I am so excited to uh, introduce today's topic and be your, your host uh, for our event today. So we are going to talk about speeding up your sales cycle, how to help you close more sales uh, with Risa. And we're going to talk with uh, two amazing guys, uh, Wade Fow and uh, Alex McGeera. And I'm going to go ahead. We're going to pop them up really good. Alex, Wade, welcome to today's broadcast. Thank you, Dennis. It is fantastic. Fantastic to have you both there. I cut off Alex before he got to say uh, his welcome. Uh, <laughs> but as we get going in today's presentation, I want to throw out a couple things to the audience. And what I do want to remind you of a couple things. First off, we are recording today's presentation, so you can refer back to that at your leisure. Uh, also, we are going to do a little Q&A towards the end. And I'd like to direct your attention down probably to the bottom right corner of your uh, of your screen. There's a little chat box. It's probably, uh, it's kind of a robin's egg blue. It's in the bottom right corner. If you click on that, you're going to see chat. You're going to see Q&A. We're also going to have a poll question for you a little bit later. But if you hit chat, I just want you to notice, if you hit chat, one, we're monitoring that. Uh, we will take those questions later. We might answer some of them as we go uh, in the chat box itself. But I want you to know this, chat is public. So if you type it in, we all see that. Everybody sees that. If you have a question, you're feeling a little bit bashful, however, go ahead, click on the, the Q&A. With the Q&A, what that does is that just goes to, to me, to Alex, to Wade. Uh, but I'll ask, I, I will ask that question for you as your proxy um, so that we can do that. Okay, so we've got that out of the way. Uh, so we're going to dive into Risa. We're going to dive into uh, what this can mean to your business. And we're going to to have Wade Fow here to talk about it, to have Alex uh, these are, I'm going to go ahead and say, young titans of the industry, um, not your stodgy grandfathers, uh, you know, Graham from a million years ago, but guys that are in the weeds right now and looking at looking at ways to help you do more business. We've partnered up. We're very excited to be partnered up with them. So why did we do that? Well, we are always looking at Creative One. We are always looking at ways to help support our advisors. A lot of re uh, regulatory saber rattling again going on. You need to show why you made that recommendation. This is a tool for that. Uh, we're going to get into what a RISA profile is, how it benefits your practice. We're going to understand the psychology behind that. And then we're going to talk about some bonus offers that we have to help you sign up. Now, again, I'm here, uh, Dennis Mattern, VP of, Cre of Market Development Creative One. Forget about me. I'm just a, I get to be the, the guy asking the questions for you. But we have Wade Fow, uh, co-founder of Risa, and then we have Alex McGeary, another co-founder of Risa. That just gentlemen, again, great to have you both here. It's an honor to get to uh, to be on this broadcast with you. Um, but and then I swear I'm going to let them both talk. Uh, but first, a quick word about Creative One for those of you who don't know who we are. Creative One, we are an IMO, and that is an insurance marketing organization. Uh, but so much more than that, we have an in-house ad agency. We have our, our own broker dealer. We also have our own corporate RIA. Our broker dealer, by the way, uh, their RIA unit number 52 in the fastest growing 100 of the last year. That's pretty, uh, that's a big deal. We understand the world as it is of the independent advisor, and we're here to support. And again, we have a complete in-house ad agency. Uh, and with that being said, though, we are so super excited for this partnership with Wade, with Alex. And without further ado, gentlemen, I'm going to do this. I am going to turn this over to have us talk a little bit about this journey, but mostly about Risa, why it is. And one of the things that I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to turn my camera off. And in fact, Alex and Wade are going to turn their camera off after a quick word uh, so that you have you that are attending that you have maximum screen. But again, reminder, look to that bottom right, that chat box is there. If you have questions, go ahead, put them in there. We'll answer them along the way. So, Alex, uh, Wade, Wade, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. But uh, Wade, welcome. Well, well, thank you, thanks, Dennis, and let me hand it over to Alex to get going with today's presentation. Hey, thank you, everyone, for attending, and thank you for that intro. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, I guess it's my turn to turn off the camera, and <laughs> the, the show will begin. Okay, and let me just go back one slide here. So what led Wade and myself to this journey that, that you know, has ultimately led us to, to this presentation? Uh, the RISA was formed out of Wade and I ultimately trying to answer the question, it depends. And what that means is 
you know, Wade's really the, the titan of, of the industry, if you will. I'm kind of like the, the tag along right now. But uh, effectively, we, we would get quest- tons of questions from our writings about uh, from, from consumers. Should, we do, should I do this or should I do that? And uh, it was never a satisfying answer when Wade and I would, would, would respond with, it depends. Right. It wasn't satisfying for us. And I'm sure it wasn't satisfying for the consumer. But the reality is that there's so much context that it's really hard to do just drive by advice. And uh, Wade and I started thinking, what does the it depend depends on? You know, what, 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 what does it what, what 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 does that really depend on? And that got us to really rolling up our researcher sleeves and just scouring the literature to identify certain factors. So then we could effectively ask the consumer what are some trade-offs that they would prefer and ultimately once we know that then we would know directionally what what area should be their focus with regards to their retirement income plan and that really led to all of this uh the 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 only other caveat wait i'm sure you agree is we didn't want to have any math involved we wanted to make it seamless for the person the moment you have to ask for a shoebox of statements we don't want to put in the work like that just from a straight up question and and frankly that serves as a deterrent sometimes. So that's what got us going into this. And ultimately, our research, and this is what Wade will unpack further along in the presentation, led us to two factors, two dimensions that really identify what would be a good starting point from a retirement income plan. So it's this blend of the psychology of of trade-offs that you're making, but with the economic overlay of tying it to retirement income strategies. And so effectively, if you take one factor being optionality oriented and commitment orientation, if you take where you are on that dimension and then you cross reference it with safety first and probability based, another style factor, you're, you're able to identify your own personal preference for how you want to source retirement income. But you're also to identify the four main retirement income strategies. I mean, listen, I, I, at the beginning, Dennis was saying uh, Robin Blue, right? And by that is there are many different colors, right? But at the end of the day, Roy G. Bibb, right? There, there's only there, there's there's a subset of colors, and and so here there's many different retirement income strategies. But if you strip it to the basics, there's really four, right? And there's dimensions on those, but there's really four. And it to the degree that you can begin to marry your personal preferences from a personality standpoint of how you want to source retirement income two viable income strategies and directionally point to them as starting points, you really begin to get onto something. And you can see how the it depends starts starts having practical application. And so what the RISA effectively is doing, it's taking your personality preferences with regards to how you feel about probability-based safety first, optionality commitment orientation. And the caveat is Wade will, again, further unpack this, just want to lay the groundwork where this is going right now. But if you take these two beliefs and preferences, you can really, you know, see where they lie, what specific trade-offs from nuance that you're making. And we can begin to point you towards one of the main strategies. Now, interestingly enough, all of these strategies have a significant role for, for annuities to play. And the even total return, which is more of a sustainable withdrawal rate, there are there are pockets where annuities play a, a significant role, but the other ones, that's their they're effectively almost like a top billing function. So what you see here is how personality assessment tool can point to a retirement income strategy. And this is something that advisors most likely, really good advisors have been doing somewhat implicitly, but we've attached a framework to this to help with that process and to actually create these aha moments for clients where their reaction is, oh, I get it. This is my style and this is where I'm resonating with. So effectively, the RISA profile is your location on the RISA matrix, identify retirement income preferences in accordance with your style. And I think this is something that folks don't realize, but you do have a style. There are many, one of the underlying thesis for all of this. Well, the main underlying thesis for all of this is that there are many ways to get your retirement income strategy correct. It's not just, you know, what's the highest number on an Excel sheet. There, there's many different ways. I pointed out, we showed you those four, and those four are actually quite credible. On its merit, hand over your heart, someone can't say that one is bad, or that one is wrong, or that's the best one. 
I want to we want to kind of disabuse you from those notions, because the reality is there's many ways to get it right. And our job as advisors, I, at least we feel, is to help guide the client on that journey based on their starting point of what strategies they resonate with. And that's effectively what the RISA is doing. So think of it as the Myers-Briggs of retirement income planning. And as you see, we, we, for, we've given thousands and thousands of these to consumers. And we put a survey monkey afterwards and ask them what, you know, what are their thoughts on it? And we get this back quite a bit. This is like the Myers-Briggs for retirement income planning. And the Myers-Briggs is a personality assessment tool to help determine what environments you may function and thrive well in, you know, those kind of things, focusing on the positive, if you will. Other similar ones are the Colby, uh, the, the, the MMPI, sometimes Enneagrams come to mind in terms of these personality assessment tools that are meant not to point out this is bad, this is good, but rather this is where this person will flourish because of the, you know, the internal temperament that this person has. This is most likely the environment where this person will flourish. Well, it's the same thing, but for retirement income planning, as opposed to focusing on like jobs, we're focusing here on what sort of assessment tool may seem to make the best sense to identify a retirement income plan. And so here, the consumer is the hero of the story. As you can see here, since we're identifying their starting point, we're effectively pointing out where they would function best. Okay. And so here, as you see here, it's a self-understanding. You start with the personality trait, which it's really blending this. It's really bringing into light the behavior finance portion of, of what we're hearing all about. It's all the rage, behavior finance. And a lot of it has to do with just these are biases and how do we you know, overcome these hurdles? But we're not looking at it in that sense. We're looking at it more from a positive psychology standpoint. And that really is interesting. It's really self-understanding. Where is this person coming from? And how can we develop a plan that begins to resonate with this? And as you can see, it's really strategy agnostic. We're not necessarily interested in this is the best team, this is the best strategy, but really what's the strategy that's right for you? The results come out, you know, pretty basic. And what you have afterwards is you get this increased awareness and acumen. You, you get to see where this person is coming from and how you can, like Legos, fit in strategies that can sync to that person. And so here, the key here is, you know, the advisor is not coming from high on the mountaintops, talking to the consumer saying, welcome, this is what you should do be based on my sense of things. It's really, this is your starting point. This is what you're resonating with. As an advisor, I have, you know, a, a plethora of strategies that I can match you up with. This seems to be the best starting point. We're not looking to rubber stamp, but we're looking to identify contextual starting points that then the advisor can guide the client on that journey. And so what do we find here? If you notice at the beginning, I had these quadrants, right? And what we find is if you look at the frequency distributions, where folks land on the quadrant, 67%, two thirds of the folks have a, a significant, significant desire for their essential expenses to have protected income. They self-identify as contractual income playing a significant role in their retirement income plan. And that's interesting because the previous slide, we wanted to start where the client is. And if you take it, if you, if you look at this, and this has been repeated in numerous national studies, what you find is that I, I think in the net, in the in the sort of in the in the industry media, if you will, we would think that oh, a lot of folks just want to put their money in a you know multiple asset class portfolio and take a sustainable withdrawal rate, and that's the retirement income plan. Well, what you're finding is 67% of the general population will actually take a step back and say, no, that's not it. We assume we assume that's the default, but it's not. The default is really some sort of protected income approach. And we find this over and over and over again. And so what does the client see if they're presented with the RISA to take? And, and, and so what we've done is this started as a research project, but we've obviously converted it into software and we call it the RISA. The RISA just in case I should have said that earlier, it's a retirement income style awareness uh, assessment tool. So RISA is, you know, laughter for short, if you will. It's also the acronym. 
And so what does the client see? As you can see here, if you send it to the client, you'll send him some, you'll send him or her a link, right? And they'll take that link, click, click, you know, click on the link, and they begin to register to take the RISA. They obviously register to create their account. They take the questionnaire. The questionnaire is done by a semantic differential which this is how many personality tool uh, tests are conducted. There's a statement on the left, there's a statement on the right, and then the person is asked to identify which statement they most closely relate to. And they do this over and over. You know, the main RISA itself is 12 questions. It's just 12 questions to take the main RISA. We have different components if you wanna have a more nuanced approach, all right? But that's what they'll see to take it. They take it and they have the option to see the results, or you can hold off on showing them the results until they come in for a prospect meeting. As you can see from a best practice, if this is a one-off, you know, a prospect that you're giving them to, yeah, it, it's 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 better to sort of let them know what they're going to be doing, but also let them know that to see the results, we'll set up an appointment. And you could do that in the last page where there's links and the like. And so ultimately, the RISA can serve as a great prospect qualification tool. Why? Because effectively, you're going to know before they walk into a meeting what style resonates with them. And so you're going to be able to refine your pitch in terms of how do you want to lead the conversation as opposed to starting off blind and through a process of elimination, you know, striking out on a few, on a few uh, potential recommendations. Here, you're going right to the meat of the sandwich and you're knowing how this person, you're knowing the worldview of this person right from the get-go. And that's something that you just don't see. I mean, the closest thing, which, you know, really is nothing like it, is like a risk question. But those are just for portfolio allocations. And they're, you know, at some point, they should be part of the process, but way further in the process. You have to begin with identifying what strategy makes sense. It also leads to a great structured discovery meeting. And what I mean by that, once you know what style this person has, once you know what retirement risk they want to take off the table, you can really begin to drill down on certain pockets of information that you feel will help you sort of expand upon what they're talking about and in a manner that's collaborative. And so that's what structured interviews are all about in psychology and discovery meetings. Really, you have sets of questions. But those are, those are used for anchor points, and then you drill down on what areas you want to further drill down on based on the answers. And the RISA gives you that great template for it. Advisor consultation, I think this is a key one, simply because consumers are, have grown wise to this. You know, you walk into somebody's office, they give you this nice PowerPoint, they show you these nice presentations, and here's the application signed, Right. I think those days are becoming less and less as opposed to more and more. Consumers are wise to the business of advice or wiser to the business of advice which each with each coming day. And you really set yourself apart when you're treating the engagement as a consultative engagement. And what better way to treat it as a consultative engagement than by having a discovery process beforehand in which you can identify potential areas that are going to resonate with the prospect you're going to be able to identify potential strategies that match those preferences. And then you're going to have in the structured discovery meeting and, you know, by default, the consultation piece, a back and forth, right? Strategy selection, again, it serves as a starting point and that Wade will unpack further. There's, there's layers to this. So once you have that starting point through that consultation, you can begin to really peel back those layers and see where, the hotspots are that will really sing and resonate with the clients. Compliance documentation. Well, ultimately now, as far as we know, this is the first time you have compliance documentation for why an annuity, a, a contractual income approach was recommended. And what better thing to show than say, hey, look, this is this is how the client preferred to source their retirement income. This is something that hasn't been around Again, as far as we know, and this is the first time in a credible manner that and, and empirically based that you can begin to actually recommend annuities with effectively a paper trail that is credible and makes a lot of sense. 
Let me go back here. And so where does the RISA fit into this process? Again, uh, something that was, I, 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 in addition to uh, the RISA and, and Wade and I managing the RISA, we're managing principles of McLean Asset Management. And, and, and frankly, we're actually, uh, I don't know if we're the newest, but we're a, a recent Creative One convert to, to, to simply help us with this whole process. They're great. So as an aside, but where does this, this fit within the process? What we're re realizing is for our own firm, we use this as a lead generation tool because it, it actually happens to be a great lead magnet. I, I think individuals, prospects, you know, as they're going through this sort of inflection point of retirement income and transitioning, there's this realization of, okay, what is this all about? And so introducing the RISA is this, oh, wow, this is kind of cool. It, it has that effect. It has that natural curiosity for people. And frankly, it runs through the tape on, on answering that it depends question to give them something to do practically. And so you're adding value. It's a great lead generation tool because a lot of times lead generation tools are kind of like gotchas. Here, I got your email kind of thing. To me, a lead generation tool has to trans, translate value. You know, there has to be value back and forth. And the reality is someone who takes the RISA in exchange, let's say, for an email as a lead generation tool is going to feel fulfilled because there was value that came out of it and you're starting that relationship really well. And so it's, it's a great lead generation tool. We've offered this to advisors independently for the past year now. And I would say this is where they really see this immediately, this immediacy for their value add. Uh, you can choose to give it before the first meeting or the second meeting with prospects. Somewhere along that sort of, you know, initial sets of meetings that that folks have, it's 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 a great tool because that's when you're really beginning to curate what solution set seems to work best with the person. And with current clients, I frequently think with current clients, it's valuable as they begin to transition into retirement. It's a great time for that quote unquote rediscovery meeting. Many times, you know, uh, if, you, if your client base is similar to every advisor's client base, everyone's getting older and the accumulation is transitioning to decumulation. When that becomes top of mind, it's a great time to have it. And frankly, there's that phrase that you hear in marketing all the time. Different is better than better. And the reality is if you're if you have a long term client and you've been doing the rinse, repeat Groundhog's Day meetings where it's OK, here's your money caller score. Here's your quarterly report you're good to go. Those can get old. And so this provides, you know, two things. It shows the clients that, Hey, look, I'm on it. I'm on the best practice. You know, we're, we're on the cutting edge of research and this is the best thing for you as you're transitioning into retirement. I've, you know, we we have a plan in place. It shows them that. And it also shows them that you know, you're dynamic in that sense that you have a solution that is for decumulation specific. And that's something that you're seeing more and more, that sort of desire, more and more, not less and less. Wade and I are hearing this with great frequency uh, with, with prospects and with readers or listeners to our podcast. Now, the major benefits of incorporating RISA into your practice, as you see, pre-appointment tool. It's a great way to effectively, you know, get that opening you know, shot over the bow in terms of a great representation of what you're about immediately. If someone takes the RISA, they're going to sort of get it and they're going to be, oh, okay, I, I see what this is about. This is interesting. And it leaves an open loop. You know, at the end of the day, great marketing is about opening loops and then closing them on the other side. Taking the RISA is a great way to open that loop. And then coming in for the meeting is a great way to close that loop. And that's, that's actually, you know, you could say the holy grail of really client engagement. And that's what you really wanna be doing. And as a pre-appointment tool, it's great. Close business factor, faster. Well, it stands to reason, right? That if you're real recognizing what this person's starting point is and what strategies they resonate with, then again, you get to that meat of the sandwich immediately, but you don't get to it without asking about them, without making that personal connection. It's not, it, it's not done in a manner that's, that's quick. It's just done in a manner that's efficient. And you're getting to, again, the heart of the matter much faster. And you're making that personal connection much faster. Deep in client relationships. Well, I mean, the reality is you can't function in a fiduciary manner if you've never taken the time to ask that client what, what their best interests are. 
right? And the RISA really gets to that immediately. And by doing that, you'll you'll see that there's a higher level of respect that you're given because all of a sudden you're providing solution sets, not from your worldview, but from the worldview of the client and how that translates into a credible strategy. And there's nothing but respect when you start from that manner. Okay. And oh, this is mine, Alex. I'm going to come in. Uh, I'm going to come in and take this slide here. Uh, so we have, as, as you've seen so far, we have an amazing partnership with Risa. We are their exclusive IMO partner. Now we're going to dive into the weeds, but I'm going to throw a poll question out to everybody. And I want to make sure that I throw it out there now. Uh, and one of the reasons I want to do this is I want to make sure that if you if you're here right now, maybe you have to leave uh, at the top of the hour. I want to make sure that we don't miss you, that we don't miss your interest in uh, Risa. And also, we are going to do a little Q&A here at the end. Also, we're going to get those questions answered uh, as we get to the end. But I do want you to know this. Uh, we're looking at $1,000 per year for a, a firm that gives you three seats at the table. You can send in, you can do unlimited Risa assessments. Uh, but the benefit here, I, I just have to tell you, the, the benefit is so big. Getting, uh, getting your clients onto the same page as you are uh, when it comes to the direction that they need to go. We've seen this a million times where maybe uh, maybe you have one, one of the spouses on board with what you're saying, but at the same time, you don't have the other spouse with you. This is a way to find out why, to really understand where they're at. Um, we're heading into a high, we're always heading into more regulation. That's just the way the world is. Um, and this is a great tool to help get your clients, your prospects on that same page. Uh, with that being said, though, let's start diving into uh, into the meat here. And uh, Wade, I think I'm turning it over to you at this point, am I not? Yeah, sure, Dennis. Yeah, I... You've seen the main overview of the different features at this point, and I'm going to dig in a little bit deeper into the weeds on this material and really explain how the RISA was developed. And in that regard, we have published several research studies uh, that has been featured in a number of different media outlets at this point. But let's start to really dive into what the RISA is all about. And in that regard, just with the responses we've had, if, book and we've had and then we have a questionnaire like get to get feedback and these are some of the comments that we get in terms of uh, the value that consumers feel that they receive by using the RISA so why is it and so that's where we'll really start to dig into the RISA itself. and in that regard as Alex mentioned he talked about the four main retirement income strategies that we look at well, I've been involved in retirement income planning now. And as soon as I got introduced into it, you see all these debates about what should people do in retirement? Is, is the 4% rule safe? Some people hate annuities. Other people think you really need a floor of protected lifetime income before you can move into investing beyond that. There's a lot of different attitudes. And then I was the curriculum director for the RMA designation. And then later the program hey, director. Wade, I, I hate to interrupt. Wait, can you speak into the mic just in case you're cutting out? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the sound's going in and out from my side. A little uh, bit. Just 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 for a hot second there. It sounds like it's it sounds like it's it's picked itself uh squared away. But okay. keep going. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so there's, well, there's these debates that happen then about what's the appropriate approach to take and having to serve in a role as a program director for these different retirement income designations, really needing to approach that in an agnostic manner. And you really can see there is value in the different strategies out there. And, and the issue is financial markets are uncertain. We don't know what's going to happen. And so psychologically, people frame their approach to dealing with that uncertainty in different manners that then ultimately translate into like different approaches for how they want to build their retirement strategies. And it's hard to say any of those are wrong as long as they're being aligned with the right person. But the concern I've had is that there's so much randomness. And as Alex mentioned, in the consumer media, the default is always to take an investments only style approach that you build your diversified portfolio it's like, I think the default everyone thinks of is you use the 4% rule, you spend 4% of your retirement portfolio at retirement, 
and then you sustain that spending throughout your retirement. And any other strategy out there is seen more as a, like a, well, you could do something else, but there's not really a need to do that, <laughs> whether it's annuities, whether it's a bucketing-based approach and so forth. But again, ultimately, I the concern is people don't have the opportunity to not necessarily know they have different options to pick from, but to even be aware that they have options and to help find the right option for them. And that's where the RISA steps into this. Uh, people just, there's no framework until the RISA to really help people sort through what type of retirement strategy is going to resonate best with me in terms of how I deal with financial market uncertainty and how I think about future planning. And that's where the RISA steps in. So the, the RISA, it, Alex's PhD is in psychology. Mine is in economics, although I'm more financial planning these days. And so we really brought together that blend of psychology research with financial planning to see, could we understand what sort of factors matter in how people think about retirement? At one point, we were looking at nine different factors. But for the RISA, we ultimately were able to come down to two factors that explains how someone approaches retirement income. And in that regard, let's talk about what those are. So the first factor we call probability base versus safety first. And this really gets into the, the type of research that I've been actively involved with on the retirement income side, where in the investments world, often it's viewed that you'll get the risk premium from the stock market, and that's all you need. And so probability based is, I'm comfortable relying on the risk premium from the stock market. I expect stocks to outperform bonds in a manner that I can benefit from. So I can build a diversified, fairly aggressive investment portfolio and sustain a distribution from that. And that will be fine for solving my retirement puzzle. Now, other people may take a safety first approach. And if someone's safety first, it's not even necessarily the case that they're not uh, optimistic about the stock market. They may still believe in the idea of stocks for the long run. They may want to have stocks as part of their retirement income strategy. But before doing that, when it comes to funding their core essential expenses in retirement, they want to make sure that they have contractual protections in place to cover uh, the unknown, that there's a degree of safety with contractual protections that is stronger than with unknown financial market outcomes. Now, that could involve holding individual bonds to maturity or, and this is back to a lot of the research I've done in the retirement income space, how using risk pooling through insurance and annuities, that the mortality credits that annuities provide are a competitive source of spending that's competitive with anything that the stock market risk premium could do so that people do have a viable option here. Are they more comfortable with the risk premium from the stock market to cover basic spending needs or would they prefer to use risk pooling through insurance? to cover basic spending needs. And so then that's a, a first point of contention where that's what a lot of the disagreement in the consumer media boils down to is, is there a role for risk pooling? Well, absolutely there is. And it's important to help people identify which approach they're most comfortable with. Then the other factor that we found to be significant in explaining people's attitudes is this idea of optionality versus commitment. And if someone has an optionality orientation, they really value flexibility for their assets above all else. They want to be able to make changes, to respond to new opportunities, to just have the option to make changes with their financial plan. Now, we often think, you know, of course, everyone likes options. And this is never an all or nothing decision. And so what the other approach is, it's commitment orientation. And, and the idea here is for some individuals, they feel like if they can find a solution that solves for their lifetime need, They'd rather commit to that, to lock it in, to take it off their to-do list, to not have to worry about it. Uh, there's also some nuances around this will help protect me from cognitive decline as I age. This will help protect other family members if I've been the one who's been managing the household finances. So if I can find something that will solve my retirement income problem, I'd like to commit to that and lock it in. And there's no right answer for any of these. Just some people are going to have more of an optionality orientation. Other people have more of a commitment orientation. And so that's where the recent matrix evolved. And, and this was the big highlight for me in doing this research was when we plot how people score along these factors. So we'll put safety first on the left, probability based on the right, optionality on top, commitment on the bottom. We get these four quadrants. 
And these four quadrants really explain the existing retirement strategies out there. So to take a quick tour of this, if we start in the upper right, this is probability based. I'm comfortable relying on the stock market and optionality oriented. I want to maintain as much flexibility as possible. I like the liquidity of a brokerage account. Well, that implies a total return investing approach. I build a diversified portfolio and I systematically spend from that in retirement. Now that's going to be a more common strategy just because of the natural correlations that exist. The other more common strategy is going to be in the lower left. So let me go to the lower left next. This is safety first. I want contractual protections behind the assets used to fund my essential spending. And I'm comfortable committing to a strategy. We call that income protection. And that's the classic first build a floor of protected lifetime income and then invest on top of that for more discretionary types of goals. But you want to have your basics covered with reliable protected income sources, with annuities, well, with social security, but then to fill any gaps beyond that with annuities that offer those lifetime protections. Now, the other two quadrants do appear less commonly in the, the population, and they're more behavioral in nature. It's ways financial professionals have developed to find strategies that suit the particular preferences. So in the upper left, that's time segmentation or, or bucketing is also known. It's safety first. I want contractual protections, but I also want to keep my options open. And so financial advisors have evolved bucketing approaches where you get your protections for short-term spending by having these short-term fixed income buckets. And then you get your optionality and growth potential with the uh, investment assets focused on growth earmarked for longer term expenses. And then in the lower right, this is probability based. I'm comfortable relying on the markets, but I'm also commitment oriented. And so this is, I want the market growth, but I want some sort of guardrail around that. I don't want to be 100% dependent on the market growth. There's, there's a sense or a nuance around that there are concerns about outliving assets and so forth. And so what you see here, this is risk graph. It's more the idea of the, what's evolved since the 1990s, you have deferred annuities with growth potential, but then with living benefits overlaid on them that can provide those lifetime protections to cover the basic spending need before investing more generally on top of that for discretionary goals. So we have these four different retirement styles that we can start to identify based on these two, two sets of preferences that individuals will have. Now, we've done numerous national studies, as Alex alluded to, with different uh, institutions and so forth, including for the Alliance for Lifetime Income. And always the way the population, like retirement age individuals between th this study here that we're specifically showing between ages 50 and 80, what's the breakdown in the population of these styles? And this is where that two thirds of the population is looking for some sort of protection we do see about a third of the population generally comes out as a total return uh, where they're comfortable with more of an investments only strategy. But everyone else is looking for commitment or protections that you don't get with a total return investment strategy. Usually income protection is the most common strategy, 35% uh, in this study, and then about 17% with time segmentation, 15% with risk grab. Now, within this, then we can start to map financial products to the different styles. Now, there's always going to be a role for investments in any retirement style. With total returns, it's more investments are earmarked to cover anything that you don't just naturally have, like a pension or Social Security. Uh, with time segmentation, it's just more you invest differently based on the time horizon. But then even for income protection risk wrap, the investment piece is earmarked for more discretionary types of goals. But where this conversation can get really quite interesting is with annuities and how you can map different types of annuities to the different retirement styles so that you're starting to be able to shortlist not only what different types of annuities play a role where, but where annuities may resonate better. And what we're generally learning from this research and from experience, when you, you have an individual in the top half of the RISA matrix, they're going to be less likely to look at an annuity for lifetime income. It, it could be more of an accumulation-based conversation. So if your total returns a story around a RILA, a registered index-linked annuity that provides you the more growth potential than an FIA, for instance, that could resonate with total returns. Also, the IOVA, the investment-only variable annuity, 
used for tax deferral purposes. Could both be considerations with total returns. If you go to the upper left with the time segmentation, this is where different types of deferred fixed annuities could play a role in those short-term buckets. With the tax deferral they provide, they can provide competitive after-tax returns compared to other fixed income assets, whether that's a multi-year guaranteed annuity, whether it's just a straight up deferred fixed annuity, or whether it's a fixed index annuity, but different options for those short-term buckets. Then in the bottom half of the RISA matrix is where annuities for lifetime income are gonna play a much stronger role. And, and the general idea is looking at what provides the strongest downside guarantees versus which has the most upside growth potential. And with income protection, there's gonna be more a focus on the downside guarantees. So the SPIAs and DIAs, the, the income annuities with the annuitization of the contracts. Also the fixed index annuities with living benefits that can often provide competitive payouts to any sort of annuitized contracts. And then as you get into risk graph in the lower right, then it's more a conversation around the growth potential. So deferred variable annuities with living benefits, whether that's a RILA with a living benefit or the more traditional deferred variable annuity with a living benefit. But the opportunity to have growth and step ups uh, may resonate better with risk wrap so that they may be willing to accept a lower downside guaranteed payout rate for that opportunity to have step ups and growth. And then you can really start to see how, how the annuity conversation can play out. Now, in one of the early studies we did before going to those nationally representative studies, we, we talked to the retirement researcher community, uh, the website we have that's more of an education-based website for do-it-yourself consumers who are pretty knowledgeable. And, and we asked them, do you own or do you plan to own an annuity for lifetime income? Yes or no? And then we mapped their answers with their retirement income styles. And we found that there's really strong predictive power in terms of who's thinking about annuities. So if you're in the upper right, the total return quadrant, the conversation around an annuity for lifetime income really doesn't resonate. Uh, they just, they feel like they want the optionality of their investments and they're comfortable relying on the growth of their investments. They don't feel a need for an annuity in that very strong upper right-hand quadrant. Only 4% 4 4 said yes to the annuity. But as you move in the lower left-hand direction, the, the answer of yes, I, I do own or plan to use an annuity for lifetime income uh, becomes stronger. And if you go to the extreme lower left-hand corner, 61% of people in that extreme income protection part of the quadrant were saying, yes, I own or plan to use an annuity for lifetime income. So this is really becoming predictive around if you're someone focused on using annuities, when are those conversations gonna resonate? That if you're talking to someone in the extreme upper right-hand corner, you're probably not gonna be able to convince them, even though risk pooling is very valuable, they're not gonna be convinced that they need it. Whereas if you focus on people more in the lower left-hand direction, those conversations are gonna resonate much better. And, and if you have the deferred variable annuities, then you know people in that risk wrap quadrant are much more likely to resonate with what that offers in terms of the, the technical liquidity for the underlying asset base, net of surrender charges, the lifetime income protections, but the uh, growth potential as well. And, and you, you can better identify who's gonna resonate with a different conversation for different types of financial products. Now there's one more aspect of this that's kind of the, but wait, there's more. And Alex alluded to it in some of the earlier conversations, but for prospects, not for clients, but for prospects, you might wanna turn on the uh, set of questions on the financial implementation matrix, where we identify two more factors that explains how somebody wants to build their retirement strategy. And to give you the 30 second overview of this, the, the factors are retirement income self-efficacy. If you have high self-efficacy, you're comfortable building your retirement plan. It, you feel like you can do this on your own. If you have low retirement income self-efficacy, you're either not comfortable doing it or you just don't wanna spend the time doing it. You'd rather be spending your time doing other things. And so that's one factor. The other factor we found is, do you perceive an, an advisor to be helpful net of their costs? Now we know advisors can be helpful, but not everyone believes that. And at the end of the day, trying to convince them that your services are of value, it, it can be a difficult conversation. But if they have high perceived advisor usefulness, they're much more likely to resonate with an, working with an advisor. If they have low perceived advisor usefulness, it's more of good luck. 
But when you plot these both together, then you have these four quadrants here where delegators and collaborators are much more likely to engage in an ongoing advisory relationship. If you're talking to someone in the lower left-hand corner here, so they have high self-efficacy, they feel comfortable doing it themselves, and they have low perceived advisor usefulness, well, good luck. These are the self-directed individuals who aren't going to accept working with an advisor. They may ask many questions, but ultimately they're never going to commit to an advisory relationship. And then if you have someone in the lower left, they have low perceived advisor usefulness, but also they have low self-efficacy as well. We call them validators. They may seek out help at certain inflection points, but they're not necessarily going to engage in an ongoing advisory relationship. Maybe it's just a matter of a one-time financial product purchase or something, but, but they need some help, but not ongoing help. And so with a prospect, if you ask these questions as well, you know someone's retirement income style, how they want to build their retirement strategy, and you know how they seek to work with a financial professional. And then you can use that to really have those initial discovery meetings, either to emphasize who you want to have those meetings with or to have a, a better flow of if it's a delegator, you don't necessarily need to go deep into the weeds. If it's a collaborator, they may have many more questions and they really want to better understand how the financial products work and so forth. And you can, so you can engage the, how that meeting is going to go based on how that individual seeks to implement their financial plan. So that being said, we can then start to look at, well, there's, there's so much more we can go in different directions, but with like basic case studies, now, one point to make clear about this is, what do you do with a couple? So we do suggest with couples, each person takes the recess separately. They don't try to do it together we, because when that's done, it's possible one person's preferences will dominate the answer choices. It's best to let each person take it separately. And it's likely they're not going to have the same style. People don't necessarily sort their um, relationship prospects based on retirement income styles. And we do see some gender differences as well, where there's a tilting that men tend to be more total return, women tend to be more income protection. And so you're likely to see different styles, but then you can start to have conversations around this. And when there's individuals that have different styles, the compromise can involve just finding something that they're both comfortable with. So in this example, if one person's time segmentation, the other is income protection, two possible options for this are well, you build those front end income protection, the time segmentation, but you build it out for longer. Maybe instead of five years, you have a 10 year income ladder to help satisfy the income protection. Or this might be a case where a QLAC, the qualified longevity annuity contract or other types of longevity insurance uh, can help allocate to provide that tail of longevity protection for the income protection person, but with less assets so that you can also satisfy the time segmentation at the same time. It really becomes a matter of, well, how can we work through this and find a strategy that both of the individuals are comfortable with? And, and Alex, do you have any further thoughts on that one? No, I, I think you're 100% right. And I'll, I'll give further thoughts when I continue here a, a little bit further. But yeah, the, the, the beauty of this is that the advisor can, again, flex his or her muscles from an advisory perspective and come up with solution sets that are very contextualized to where they're coming from. If you, if you know, right now, if you're left to your own devices, what usually happens if there's uh, some discordance is you split the difference on a risk tolerance questionnaire, but that still assumes a total return approach. Where here, you're really digging deep into what strategies make sense that satisfy both folks, not necessarily compromise both folks into a solution they're not even interested in to begin with. So I, I, I think that's, you know, that's my quick hit on that. But, you know, what does this look like on a report standpoint if you're speaking with a client or a prospect? And here, he took some screenshots in the interest of, of efficiency. But if, a, you know, I, I gave the initial slides where somebody was taking the RISA, if you're, they come in for the meeting, you can obviously download and print the report. But if you have it in the conference room and you're like shooting it up, well, on the TV screen, well, you, you know, you really go over it like this in which they see where they landed on these factors. I'm not going to provide too much color just to just to give you a, a sense of the smell of, of all of this, if you will, the, the the gestalt of this. And so here you see here they're able to see where they land on it. So it's very quick and easily understandable. 
we source, as you scroll down, we source among those factors the statements that they resonated with the most on that factor. So you can begin to start having a conversation with this client. And what I always like to say is the RISA, the questions and the statements are given at face value. You know, they're, we're not asking, you know, do, were you born in Iowa? Did you go to high school in Detroit? Hence, you know, if you did that, you're a safety first person. It's more, if you, if you read these statements, you take a quick moment to read them. At face value, they just make sense. I think that's the key. What we're doing is bringing up the trade-offs conversation, and it gets to the point where, well, the only things that are really going to satisfy these preferences, you know, become, become apparent. And so once you have the RISA factors where that person is, you can give another, sets of, another set of questions, which are retirement concerns. What retirement risk do you want to take off the table? Longevity being the primary one. And here it starts making sense because if somebody's primary financial concern is having enough retirement income for their essential needs when they're retired, well, that's, that speaks to a floor of income. And that speaks to this sort of result. And so you can begin to see consistencies that during a conversation help further flesh out what the strategy is. Now, if you do happen to see inconsistencies with, you know, with retirement concerns, then you can begin to further, you know, drill down on that and, you know, see what's, what, what's at the heart of the matter there. And so you have the RISA retirement concerns, and this would be like an implementation preference. If you have a prospect, you know, you want to see what's walking through your door before that meeting happens. And this person, you know, comes out as a delegator. Well, Wade was giving you the, the the sort of the overview here. A delegator, this is interesting from the cadence of information. You know, not only are you aware of how they want to source retirement income, but, you know, some people are highly analytical. Some people are really outsourcing this and don't want to get into the weeds. And so a delegator would be somebody that kind of wants to know how the, what time it is and not necessarily into the, into the, the weeds, whereas a collaborator would probably want to know both things. You know, they want to be part of that team, if you will. And so you see this in the report. And how do how do consumers react? Because even though we can say we've published this in peer-reviewed journals and the like, you really want to know how individuals feel. Because at the end of the day, you presenting a RISA to a prospect is a reflection of yourself. And so here with here we have a thousand so far, and you know, we still do them, but this is when we did the, the sort of the the slides you know, 4.3. It's, it's a very, it's, it's very well received from folks, you know, out of five. And we asked them, you know, how did it capture your style? These are just quotes that are out there in their own words, if you will. This is recorded. So you can see this, you know, at your own discretion. But as you see here, we couldn't have written these ourselves. It, it's, it's really, it's really gratifying for Wade and myself to give this out. And this is, these are write-ins of how they, they felt here. And as you can see, it's, it's one of those things that you want to strive for. As you see, it can align your head and your heart so you can define a sustainable retirement income strategy. I mean, that really is as good as it gets when, when regards to this. As you can see here, another outcome. So I'll, I'll, hand, I'll, I'll hand it back off here. Oh, perfect, perfect. Sorry about that. There, I had my uh, I had myself on mute. I was enjoying this. Uh, so we are coming towards the end, and uh, I tell you what: if you look over into the polls, and we're gonna get a we're gonna get another question out to you here to everybody. But if you look over in the polls, if you're interested in this, so chat Q and A. There's a poll box there. If you're interested, click the box uh, of where you sit at the moment, uh, and we will get more information out to you. Uh, but we would like to invite you on this journey as, as Wade and Alex has, have talked about, uh, there really is so much opportunity out there um, for us as advisors to be talking to our clients, to our prospects, but to continue to have these conversations and also to have these conversations go deeper. I love the part what, uh, Al, or what Wade had talked about. Uh, with spouses and with existing clients because they see things differently. I can think of a million times where maybe a, a client, one of the clients passes away, uh, the other spouse takes their business because the connection wasn't there. Um, and that's definitely something. So there are additional bonuses. Uh, Risa has an education center. Uh, I'm going to get over my skis here probably pretty quick, fellas. Uh, so Alex, you want to walk us through this area? 
Yeah, sure. Uh, this is effectively the education center, and we're actually also going to be turning it into a continuing education center with all things retirement income and uh, the state of the art with regards to retirement income and who better than Wade to lead that charge. But in the education center, think of it as a RISA manual, you know, all things you wanted to know, but were afraid to ask kind of kind of section. And here we'll get into the how it works, the quick start guide, understanding outputs, how to translate them into something meaningful during the meeting, understanding the questions, how to use it with your clients. Again, Creative One, it you know hits it out of the park from all things marketing. We also have little scripts on you know running a RISA webinar and things like that. So it's all things you wanted to know about the RISA from a manual perspective and from a from a sort of workflow perspective that we're afraid to ask. We have it here and significantly more is coming from the standpoint of retirement income. We really want to make it into this community where everyone can begin to have conversations about best practices for retirement income. And that's the education center that you see here. Awesome. Well, let's talk about the other bonus. Bonus number one is an executive retirement income strategy session. This is a 90-minute session with Wade and Alex on how to customize the framework of the RISA for your firm, for your firm's specific solution sets. Um, we'll also hold small uh, consultation set, co consulting sessions, tough word there, uh, you know, six to eight advisors per group, depending on practice similarity. So we've got that. Uh, then we've also got bonus number two, and that is RISA hosted retirement income planning workshops. And this is interactive. This is sustainable spending from investments in retirement, really getting in there, talking about Medicare, healthcare, healthcare decisions but then also annuities and risk poolings. And then there are CE uh, available for organizations that accept CFP board programs. So we do have that as well. Um, now, uh, that poll question sitting over there, are you interested in moving forward with the recent? Man, I don't know how you couldn't be interested. Uh, and if you sign up today, we have complimentary signed books, uh, signed copies of Wade's latest book, The Retirement Planning Guidebook, because uh, you should always be adding education, more arrows to your quiver. Uh, and then we've got the more information up here. Now we have a couple minutes. We're just a, we're really tight on time. Of course, we want to be respectful of that. Um, but with that being said, um, gosh, uh, Wade and Alex, what questions? Uh, let's take a couple questions. Maybe answer a couple questions in, from the Q and A. This is your opportunity. If you look at the chat box, I know questions have been answered over there. Uh, if you're feeling bashful, use the Q and A. Only I'll see that. I'll be your proxy. Uh, but Alex, wait, anything that we uh, that we missed that we should be talking about here? Uh, no, there, there was a there, there was a question with regards to the RISA and, you know, the next up again, think of this as a spectrum. So it's always the the next solution set that you can work into. I'm, I'm happy to answer that in greater detail, but that's there. A question came up about taking a RISA. Uh, I can coordinate with Jessica if you want to take it first yourself. I, I, I think that's a, a great idea. That's that's not an issue on our end. I just don't want to speak for Jessica, you know, right now with, with regards to that. But again, uh, the other thing I think I would take us up on, simply put, is the consulting session. This is something that, you know, if you wanted to hire Wade to go, to go under the hood of your firm and see, you know, how your retirement income strategies stack up uh, from a best practices perspective and now intertwined with the RISA, that's something that uh, would probably not be cost effective on a one on one basis. But because we can do this with Creative One, this is something I would definitely take us up on. It, it's it, that alone is, is a heck of an offer that I would take us up on. And I can't stress enough just the education center as we begin to flesh that out is going to be a go to resource for you for all good things, retirement income strategy. So uh, I, I, I think it's I, I think it's fantastic. Uh, additionally, I can't stress enough. I mean, working with Creative One, you know, with my McLean Asset Management hat on and the RISA, I don't see how we're going to slow down. This is something that we started a few years ago and probably 18 months ago, we started beginning to add annuities into our practice and we really haven't looked back, you know, so much so that we needed the, the help of Creative One to really, you know, continue with this flywheel. And so this is something that has just quite changed the game for how we run our firm. And again, so much so that other advisors were coming up to us asking for the RISA. And that's what kind of as a business standpoint, Wade and I said to ourselves, look, we're onto something here. Let's let's provide this for everyone because 
this is more about a movement about like bringing you know frankly respectability and credibility back into our industry you know from the standpoint of retirement income from a structured contract standpoint has a significant role and there's no reason why we're not shouting that from the mountaintops you know with our head held up high and i think the risa really represents that first sort of ignition to get that to get that moving uh wade what any thoughts on your end yeah no i mean absolutely with all the kind of education opportunities coming down recently my book so <laughs> grabbing a hold of the book with this offer uh it's been approved for a 24 credit hour self-study ce course that will be getting onto the education site in the coming weeks so yes lots Lots coming down that way as well. We're looking forward to working with as many people as possible to help just bring uh, this idea that people have choices for retirement income. There's different viable options. Let's get people matched to the option that resonates best for them. Yeah, and and I'll say this: as advisors, we always like a good deal. Look, Creative One worked with one worked with us to, to be able to bring to you folks effectively an exceptional offer. This is something that if you were to buy it independently from us, it's going to cost you $14.95 per license. And so, you know, we were, you know, they, we, we wanted to really, how can we get this so that it has a multiplier effect to, to the entire universe of Creative One? And I think it's, it really is. I mean, it's something that could be tried, but it really is an incredible deal to offer up to three seat licenses for $1,000. It, it's something great to to uh, to take advantage of us. And it's so much so that I got to say anecdotally, I mean, there's there's tons of advisors that not tons, but there's hundreds of advisors that have started using this over the past year. And the stories that we get back in terms of how they've used it to to actually introduce the concept of annuities and actually close business has been, you know, nothing short of remarkable. And, you know, I, again, I, I can't impress upon you take advantage of this deal. It, it's, it's actually quite exceptional on many levels. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hop in here, fellas. Uh, I'm going to put that, I want to put that out there one more time to make sure that everybody, uh, everybody sees that poll question, but uh, just so we know indications of interest and we'll be able to reach out to you. Um, if you're interested, go ahead and answer whatever way, wherever you fall, just to make sure we don't miss anybody. I do want to hit a couple points here. Uh, one, we did record today's presentation, so we will get a copy of that out to uh, for you to be able to refer back to it. Uh, there are some amazing uh, opportunities that you have here that you've seen with Alex and Wade. And uh, again, it's always an honor to be here with, uh, with Wade and Alex, uh, two gentlemen that are really diving into our business and bringing conversations forward for our for our our clients uh, and our prospects. I mean, my goodness, if you look at the studies that come out when it shows retirement ready uh, readiness and where people are in their heads, uh, there is a huge, huge disconnect in what it's going to take to retire and have the retirement that people want and what people have. And we are at the vanguard. We're at the forefront of these conversations and we need, we, and meaning all of us on this call, need to help educate. And there is no better tool here uh, to get that conversation started uh, than Risa. And it really adds from a compliance standpoint, from a uh, agent education standpoint, uh, it is just absolutely fantastic. Um, so we've, we've passed the, uh, we've passed the, uh, the hour mark. Uh, so I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, Wade, Alex, final thoughts. Um, I'm good. Uh, I, again, even beyond this, any questions, uh, contact Jessica. I'm obviously more than happy to hop on the phone with anyone. I think we're at your service. I mean, consider us as an instrument to to your success in your business. I mean, as soon as, you know, I, we're, we're effectively, we're on the Creative One team. And so we're here to help you in any manner that we can. That's right. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Perfect. All right. With that being said, on behalf of Wade, on behalf of Alex, uh, on behalf of Creative One, I would like to thank you for taking time out of your busy day uh, to spend it with us, to learn, to uh, to be exposed to a new sales tool that I think will make a massive difference in your practice. Uh, with that being said, uh, let's all go have a great rest of our day. Thank you so much.